Hello, everyone, and welcome to our uh, Tipping Point uh, panel. I'm Alejandro Agag. I'm the founder and CEO of uh, Xtreme. And thank you very much. Thank you very much. And um, I hope you enjoyed uh, the race. I think it was a fantastic uh, event, a fantastic show. And uh, what a great way to have the first ever race in Greenland, because there's never been an event probably uh, like this in this uh, amazing island. Uh, I came here the first time five years ago. I fell in love with the place. And when we started, when we created Formula E, uh, one of my main dreams was to uh, have a race here uh, in Greenland. And, uh, and we made it. And I'm so happy and so happy that all of you could share with us this uh, incredible moment. And um, this is what Extreme E is about. Extreme E is a racing championship. And I always say that. Uh, it's important for everyone to make the contribution we can make in, in our daily activity. I, I am myself not a scientist. I cannot make a contribution from science. Um, I'm not many things, but I'm a race organizer. Uh, I love motor racing. It's what I do. And I thought that motor racing could also make its own a small contribution to something as important as uh, climate action. And to serve as a platform, uh, to give a voice uh, to the scientists, because science is the... Uh, really the leader, the one that we need to follow, um, to break the bubble, like uh, Cristiana Figueres says, to be able to address a wider audience. Because um, as we know what the problem is, uh, and we are convinced, but Extreme has an audience of close to 20 million uh, people watching every race, and many of them are not that concerned about climate change. Some of them don't even know that climate change is there, or they're not familiar with the problems that are going on right here uh, in the Arctic Ice Cap. And if you could uh, watch uh, some moments of the broadcasting, we have the race, but we embed messages. We had Peter on the broadcasting, we had Carlos on the broadcasting, uh, telling the, this big audience uh, very important messages. So that's, that's what we are here to do. Uh, and of course, the core of it is the racing. And I was so happy to have such an amazing race, an amazing racing uh, show uh, today here in Greenland. So uh, with that, um, I uh, leave you with Peter. Peter um, has been with us from the beginning. Peter Waldam is uh, the first scientist that recorded how the ice cap was shrinking. I don't know how many times you've been in nuclear submarines under the ice cap. Too many, <laughs> sleeping in the torpedo uh, you know, hole, or whatever they call it. Um, but you know, uh, Peter is a huge authority um, on, on the, what's happening here in the Arctic. Uh, he came with us two years ago here. We were walking around this, this location, dreaming of where the cars could uh, race. And uh, since then, Peter is chairing our scientific uh, committee. So Peter is, a, a, of course, a much more uh, authorized voice than, than mine to tell us what's going on here. Peter, thank you for being here. Well, Well, thank you. I'd like to pay, obviously, tribute to you for everything that you've done here, which is ne everything that we see around us. Um, so I'm uh, the chairman of the Science Committee, and the idea that, uh, uh, that Alejandro had in setting up a Science Committee, at least I think that's the idea, was to have a member who's in each of the areas of the remote, the remote world where the, the extremely intends to go and have races, uh, each part of the world has some specific thing wrong with it <laughs> or some specific problem that, that uh, is, needs to be addressed. Uh, so in every case, there's a specialist around who could lead science programs in that particular area. And I think that's a great idea. And uh, in, in this case, I guess I'm the one for Greenland, but, but we have other great scientists around here today who, who are, have been leading research in other parts of the world and in the parts of the world that we're going to next. So the, the idea, I think, of, of coupling uh, environmental science and trying to, to tackle uh, environmental problems to, that are of a climatic nature, so climate action problems with things that need doing now um, is a great one because it combines each of those problems with a race. And then the race 
appeals to the public, it's exciting, and it's, it has a huge circulation of, of people who are following it, which doesn't happen with, with simply a David Attenborough programme on climate change. You, you have many more millions of people um, watching uh, an exciting uh, race which is already in itself without anything else, without an accompanying science program, is already accomplishing a great deal because it's with electric cars and it's showing that, that uh, electric cars are desirable vehicles to have, uh, especially if you want to drive fast through, <laughs> through sand, <laughs> but <laughs> whether, even if you just want to drive to the shops, the electric car is the answer and it's, it's the answer in a way that will, will reduce our re dependence on, on fossil fuels and will be a way forward towards trying to rescue the world from the, the, the bad shape it's getting into. So I think the, the idea of an electric car racing is, is brilliant in itself, but the addition of, of science and scientific support and legacy science to each of the races is also a kind of inspired idea that I think will 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 do a great deal. Even though, as uh, Alessandro said, you know you can't do a huge amount um, in one go. You can still do a lot of things which will will sow the seeds of appreciation of climate change problems and people will start to think, oh yes, I can do something about this, or I can encourage my, my um, member of parliament to do something about it. That's less likely, but uh, doing something about it yourself is possible. So I think this is a, a wonderful, in two ways, of, of having the electric racing in the first place, and then having it in places which, where there's very obviously uh, environmental problems that need to be tackled. Here, I just sort of, I guess, mention some of the ones here. And this is the most, probably the most environmentally challenged place that we've been to so far. And, uh, be, and especially, Greenland has suddenly become a very much a center for climate change problems, which, and it sort of happened maybe coincidentally with our presence because just just after we got here, the first rain was observed on the top of the Greenland ice sheet, 4,000 metres above sea level. That's never been seen before at that height. So that means the melting of the ice sheet is progressing so fast that um, if you go up 4,000 metres, which you can do if you go up to the, the drilling site up there, um, you, you'll, get, you, you'll get rain uh, rather than just ice. And in fact, it's, it's such an unprecedented thing that, that the scientists up there don't have rain gauges to measure it. Uh, then last week, um, there was uh, a discovery of a new island uh, off the north of Greenland, which is the northernmost land in the world. Uh, it's a little island that's only 30 uh, metres long, or 30 kilometres long, so it's a bit, bit better. Um, but it, it was caused, produced by the, uh, the sea ice, um, which is retreating all the time, um, now uh, being moved around by the wind, pushing up the, sea, the sediments. And this has already happened in northeast Greenland, uh, so we we already have some data on this with an island called Tobias Island that the Danes discovered of, and put a flag on it. That I've seen the flag waving away. Uh, and then a year later, the island disappeared again. And so presumably the flag disappeared. But it was an island produced called an ice push feature. The ice was pushing the, the island up. And uh, this has happened just last week off north, northwest Greenland. So the that the furthest north land on the planet ever seen is is in this on this island or just off this island. So Greenland, you can see, is already a hotbed of of climate change phenomena that that are really important. And the most important one is, of course, the fact that with the ice sheet melting so fast, 
uh, we, it's causing, in fact, it's the main factor in causing sea level rise. And um, that's the reason why the, the science program on this trip has uh, been focused a lot on taking sea, sea ice samples where the, the sea ice, when you go onto the ice sheet, which I guess every, all of you have been, you don't find a nice, clean, beautiful white ice sheet like you expect. You find a sort of dirty, squalid looking ice sheet, which is brown and black. And that's because the, the clean ice that's sitting there melts and it sinks down through various waterfalls and uh, other features to get to the ocean. But it leaves behind the dirt that had been spread on it by the wind over the last few uh, years, decades, and that uh, some of that is due to the, the wildfires we've been having in the last year or two being much more intense than before. And uh, so the dirt that we've always assumed to be due to dust being fl blown across the Atlantic is actually quite likely to be largely or partly due to uh, due due to uh, the actual burning of the, of the wildfires, especially in Siberia, where they're uncontrolled. And uh, so we, if we sample those, we can, we can go back to the lab and determine where, where the dirt comes from and determine how much of that increased rate of melt and increased, uh, increased uh, amount of... Uh, uh, of sea level rise is due to the the burning of the burning of the planet basically uh, so that's that's the one of the basic science things we're doing here and it's been very valuable i think so anyway i i'll pass on to the next speaker i think rather than uh, hopefully that's richard <laughs> Good afternoon to you all. I'm Richard Washington. I'm a member of the Science Committee on Extreme E. I'm a climate scientist by trade, and I have to say that my day-to-day -day job doesn't involve sitting down with two superstars in Greenland to introduce a discussion. So I am very grateful for the opportunity from Extreme E uh, to be able to do this. I'm here with Christiana Figueres and Lucas de Grassi, uh, superstars in their own right. And what we want to do in this conversation is bring together to make that nexus uh, real, um, to gain perspectives from different coordinates of the problem that we're trying to engage with. Christiana Figueres is founding partner of Global Optism. She's also co-author of a bestseller the beautifully named The Future We Choose. And she's co-presenter of leading independent climate podcast, Outrage and Optimism. Welcome, Christiana. Lucas. <laughs> Lucas, world champion in Formula E with a very long list of accomplishments in motorsport of all sorts, including Le Mans, including uh, Formula One. He has, in addition, a very well-deserved reputation as a novel and innovative thinker, which at the same time is very grounded in technology, something he knows an awful lot about. We have here then the seeds for a very interesting discussion, bringing together these elements of the problem which is the way that Extreme E does things. As a scientist, I'd like to start on very familiar ground, and that is with the scientific report that came out in early August. That's the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change. It was a long wait for that report. It came out early August this year, 2021, but the previous report was back in 2013. In many ways, the IPCC reports are an extraordinary achievement. They somehow managed to put many, many hundred, hundreds of scientists in the same bag and come out with a consensus story at the other end. 
So to introduce the conversation, let me ask Christiana what her views on the IPCC report are. How far have we come since 2013? Was the language on the money? Thank you, Richard, and good afternoon to everyone. How exciting has today been? <sighs> Honestly, that last race, I thought my heart was going to pop out and I have to like come back here. So exciting. Um, and it's so exciting that uh, Alejandra has had this incredible vision of bringing electric racing together with the understanding, the global understanding of climate change, because it just, as, as Peter has said, it just helps so much to understand something that otherwise would be uh, very complex. Um, so to the IPCC report that Richard has alluded to, Interesting to understand that it was written by 238 authors of 66 countries, and what they did was bring together the results of 14,000 studies that had been done by them and many others into one coherent text, which is actually quite a feat in and of itself. But then the scientists, once they have done that, then they have to take the scientific report through a political filter and then all the governments of the world have to agree to every single comma and every single paragraph, which has always been the process, but the result of that in the past has been that all of these scientific reports have been watered down because there are many governments who would rather not tell exactly the truth and have something that is a little bit less alarming. So the fact that this IPCC report that has followed exactly the same process, first science, then the political filter, the fact that this report for the first time puts forward a very, very compelling and clear alarm bell on climate change is actually quite amazing. It means that science has, frankly, and I say as, as a, um, a former and surviving uh, diplomat, science has triumphed over politics um, because the political you know, voices were not able to water down uh, the very clear language that scientists wanted to give us. So there are two, I, you are welcome to read thousands of pages if you want, um, but I will give you the summary, my summary anyway, two things that I think are notable about this. The first, the language is unequivocal. The first of these, which was way back in 2000, what? 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 1990, in order to prepare for the Kyoto Protocol 1997. So the first one, sort of said, well, yes, maybe climate, and maybe it's human-made, and perhaps under certain conditions, and it was very, very tenuous language. Um, A, because the certainty in science wasn't there, and also because the political filter didn't allow it. Now the science is absolutely clear, and the language, the tone of the language in this report is remarkable. There is no conditionality, there's no excuses, this is it, and frankly, this, we are totally running out of time. So the fact that the language is so clear and so compelling is something that we should sit up and take a note. And the second part that I think is very notable about this report is the fact that way back in prehistory, 2015, um, when we thought, oh, there probably isn't too much of a difference between 1.5 degrees as a ceiling for, for global warming or two degrees, um, well, the fact is that this report confirms what we have known since the IPCC report of 2018. Actually, there's a world of difference between two, one degree point, 1.5 degrees and two degrees. And furthermore, for the first time, scientists tell us very unequivocally that we stand before the threat of being able, or not being able, of surpassing the threshold of 1.5 degrees, not in 250 or at the end of the century, but rather somewhere between 2030 and 2040, as soon as that. So the urgency of actually acting on climate change has never been clear has never been as urgent. And what that actually means is that this decade, before we get to 2030, is what we call the decisive decade. Because it's in this decade that we shall determine whether we're able to get on track with addressing climate change or not. Which is why technology is so important, right? Because um, we all know that policy is important, but governments are notably slow, not exactly racing to the top. Um, governments are slow. We all know that financial shifts are important, 
But the third leg of that is definitely the advance of technology. And so there is where I want to turn over to Luca to uh, share with us the importance of pushing on the boundaries of technology and then bringing that technology actually to address the, uh, the big issues. Um, she looked at me this way because we were discussing Brazilian politics a bit earlier on <laughs> and <laughs> hadn't been very easy. <laughs> So thank you, uh, Um First, I'd like to say that um, I always had this dream of becoming a racing driver, but Alejandro, with his vision and with his will to make Formula E, we've been, he has been doing that for 10 years now, and I've been on his side, and he served to me as a big inspiration. And I managed to put my purpose with my passion together and do what I love, which is race, together with the purpose of making the world a better place through technology. I think Alejandro said that we serve a platform, Extreme e serves as a platform for 20 million people, but also motorsport serves as a platform to develop technologies. You guys take for granted seat belts, disc brakes, ABS, they were all developed in racing. And the biggest problem we have to solve right now is to get the variable of sustainability into the equation of how to solve problems in society. So we cannot just say, stop doing that, don't do that. People don't do that for free. You, we have to use technology to embed sustainability into every layer, into every industry, in a way that the rational decision is actually making sustainability. Mm -hmm. And we can only do that creating value, solving problems, and using um, and using technology to advance the world. So that's what I love about what has been done in Formula E and what is, we are doing in Extreme E, because we are pushing also the technology. We are uh, pushing the boundaries of what has never been done before. Never an electric car has driven in a conditions like today. Never in history. And we see the car breaking down here and there, and these will be fixed, and these solutions will be embedded in the future products. And then people will be more confident to, to buy their electric cars. So, and when the electric cars, and why we are going through this revolution right now is because electric cars, the total cost of ownership. So when you buy an electric car and the total cost of using it on average is getting, is already cheaper than a combustion car. So even for developing countries like Brazil and Brazilian, the technology only with the technology we are providing a solution that will make, for example, mobility cheaper with electric cars and sustainable at the same time, then you have massive, massive adoption. Otherwise, it's very hard. And uh, so my question, back to you, Christian, is what, is what is the role of the developed country to push the boundaries of, or push the le legislation and the, the technology forward so the whole world can look at something as a direction in terms of policy. I love the way two people from the global south are discussing what the role of the global north is. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, the role of the global north um, is uh, quite an important uh, role and a responsibility for a couple of reasons. First, let's just start with the moral reason, because it is the global north that has caused climate change. That's not ideology. That's not, you know, a belief system that is simply the facts, those are the numbers. Um, but also, it's because, in general, the global north has much more access to this technology and has the resources available to invest into the pushing forward the technology um, because the global north as a whole, and it's not always the case, uh, has actually gotten a hold of the poverty problem, uh, and at least in some, and I'm thinking here perhaps not, um, but uh, the Global South is still very much having to focus on how do they bring up uh, the level of poverty and how do they do that in a clean way. But I also wanted to come back to your point, Luca, because you mentioned several, time, several times pushing the boundaries. And I think interestingly enough, that allows me to tie the dots between the science and what we're doing here. Um, because the fact is, science has told us that we have, have already broken several boundaries in several ecosystems that are frankly by now irreparable. It is irreversible. 
And if you would like to understand this, I highly recommend that once you've watched all the replays of the race today, you then sit down and you watch a documentary that is probably the most do fam uh, uh, important documentary that has ever been made. It's called Breaking Boundaries. It's on Netflix. And it explains exactly how many boundaries on this planet and how many ecosystems we've already broken through and what the consequence of that is. But breaking boundaries is a fact in science. It's also a fact in technology, right? And this race, this whole um, extreme E, as well as Formula E, is a very good example of how we can and we must continue to break boundaries in technology in order to get to a very different space. Honestly, you know, I, I, I'm 65. I certainly expect to be alive by the time most people on this planet are actually driving cleanly. Or in fact, let me rephrase that, most people are transporting themselves cleanly because they will not be owning cars. They will probably be using cars as a service and not as a good. So a huge revolution underway in the transport sector, but not only in the energy sector, in the food sector, in the, land, in the agriculture sector. And we must be able to push beyond and break the boundaries that we think are there with all of these technologies in order to be able to get to exponential change of technologies that would then compete in the race that we have ongoing, which is the exponential damage on the planet. So if you think about it as two curves, there's exponential damage on the planet going forward in an exponential way, and there's exponential increase in technology development, and those two curves are racing against each other. And depending on which one wins, that is going to be the state of the planet, and that's going to determine the quality of life for humans on this planet. So very important that we actually break through the boundaries of technology and also of what we think is possible, because we won't break through technological barriers until we change our attitude and say, we can do this. So mental breakthroughs too. I can't agree more, and um, when you look at the CO2 emissions, you can look at the transport, agriculture, um, and um, so transport, food production, uh, manufacturing, and um, transport accounts for about 30%. Owning cars is about, uh, so car part, uh, private cars is about 4% of total emissions. So. It's, of course, everybody owning electric cars will give a step forward. But then you need to provide the energy for, for the car. There are different solutions for different places. And we can only do that through technology. We can only um, still increase the quality of life at the same time as um, decreasing the emissions and transition from a fossil-based economy to um, a clean economy. And I'm from Brazil, and Brazil is a, a, a perfect example of also how the government policies sometimes delay, sometimes on purpose, the direction that uh, it could be done in a certain way. Um, I'll give you an example. Uh, in um, uh, solar photovoltaic cells, ele electricity production, Brazil is actually produced, has a solar incidence which is twice as much as average Europe. So average Brazil is, one well, panel in Brazil is twice as much efficient. Currently, they are discussing on taxing extra the photovoltaic panels because you're not basically buying from the concessions that are already in place, which is uh, another way of delaying this, which happened with lobbying for combustion cars, which happened in many other industries. And um, we are uh, also, we face, the, uh, we face the problem of um, the... the the biosphere with the Amazon being destroyed. Brazil is 250 million people. A lot of them are under the poverty level. They are they basically looking for the next day instead of having the conscience of what needs to be done for the future. But it's not their choice. It's basically because they have to do it. So um, I'm very pragmatic. So um, in a way, we need, again, to provide a much better value if we want to change some industry and if we want to make the, the world greener. And um, oil has shifted our society, has increased massively our quality of lives, has increased 
massively the, the, our lifespan in many different, and pretty, pretty much the whole world. Industrial revolution completely changed, but now we have the technology know-how to transition for a renewable era. And that's uh, what makes me very excited to wake up every day. One of the one of the really impressive snippets uh, for me in Extreme E is how the cars are powered by by a clean uh, fuel, clean electricity with the hydrogen fuel cell. And I overheard a conversation today saying that's the first time in Greenland that such green green fuel has ever been generated, and it's still going on just a few hundred meters away, which is quite remarkable. Taking back the conversation very uh, to a few moments ago about the adoption and the role of the, the developed world. Uh, looking back at, in, in Africa at the technology, one of the things that, that really uh, blew me away was the, the speed with which cell phones and mobile phones uh, came into circulation. Uh, the technology needed to be developed, but once it was there, it solved problems that had been on the continent for decades simple communication problems that would have cost hundreds of millions in the form of uh, landlines to put in place that were swept away. It's almost as though the continent jumped uh, several decades in one go. When you look back at, at your time and your careers, what can you say about the, uh, the uptake of, of technology, the uptake of ideas? Do you see uh, colleagues uh, do you see the political process in Christiana's uh, case as being stubbornly slow? Is it uh, the case that it's down to a few individuals to move it along? Is it down to chance? How does it work? Well, it works the way any social and economic uh, change works, which is they're always 10 to 20 percent out in front. Then there is a vast middle that is about 50 to 60 percent that doesn't know which way to go and then you have about five to ten percent of laggards who will never move So my suggestion is forget about the laggards. They're never going to move. Just leave them there. That's their problem Let's go with the ones that are pushing forward and get the movable middle to move with us um, and on that I really like your your example of cell phones because it is a very good example of leapfrogging technology, right? And that's exactly what we can do with renewable energy. Today we have 800 million people around the world who are inexcusably still living without electricity, which means they're in abject poverty because electricity is the first thing to get you out of poverty. And you cannot solve that with fossil fuels because with fossil fuels you have huge centralized plants, then you have to have these you know, long distribution lines, very much like uh, telephony. And and if the fossil fuel industry, which was great the last century, and we thank them and we honor them, but frankly, it is time to put them in the museum and move on to the new technologies of 21st century. With renewable energy, with one solar panel, you can reach every single one home of these 800 million people because no matter where they live, they don't need, we don't need to extend the grid all the way over there. You can have electricity in every single home. And that means you can power your little cell phone, et cetera, et cetera. So yes, so the global south can and must be able to be supported so that they can leapfrog in energy just like they have been leapfrogging in um, telephony. And that would actually uh, also speak very deeply to social justice in this world. Um, I can't agree more, and if you combine this with the decentralization, so using technology to have decentralization of different industries, um, like finance, for example, or in this case, photovoltaic with electricity and, some, and everything else, uh, I think this bringing one of the things that data that I at least I read, the data suggests that as soon as people get their basic need covered, they start caring much more about the environment than if they don't, because your priority shifts. Basically, if you're hungry, the first thing you don't care about the environment, you need to eat first. But as soon as you have your basic uh, covert, you start caring a little bit more about the environment. You start having um, uh, sewage treatments. Uh, you have start do having a lot of other uh, benefits for the environment. So I think one of the problems we're going to face is that how we develop the economies of countries, of billions of people 
that they want to consume, they want to reach our standard of living without emitting CO2. So that's a very, very, very hard problem. It's not only cutting. For us to cut is relatively straightforward with technology. But to develop an economy from scratch without generating CO2 to give more equality uh, in society is much harder. It is a much harder problem. And we cannot do that just by redistributing wealth. Because if you redistribute, they will consume goods that are produced by CO2. So it's, it's a fundamental shift that we need to happen. And for me, this is the key problem of um, sustainability in the future will be more people consuming more. How do we do, how do we take them to a different level uh, without creating more problems? I'm going to just put you both on the spot to wrap up the discussion and ask you a question. Earlier, Christiana pointed out that we're right now at the tipping point in the possibilities that we have. Time's closed out on it. This is a decade. We lose this chance, and we've had it. If we sit here, then the Greenland ice sheet will melt past us. So judgment call, are we going to make it? Are you optimists? You go first. No, no, no. I want to see what <laughs> We are so going to make it because we don't have another option, OK? Now, here's the question. Someone asked me this question, some journalist asked me the question this morning, and I said, I'm going to ask you a different question. If your child is walking across the road and you see a bus coming at your child, will you not do absolutely everything to throw yourself there and rescue that child? And the answer from the journalist was yes. That's exactly what we have to do right now. The bus is coming at our children, and it's coming very fast. So there is no option here but to throw ourselves into this and actually, yes, address this on time and at scale. No other option. Punto final. What can I say? Uh, um, I, I'm, I'm a bit more skeptical. I think... I think oh, that no, let me take the microphone away <laughs> What frustrates me a lot is the state of uh, democracy in general and how populism not necessarily aligns with uh, what needs to be done on the long term for the, for the world. Populist ver uh, visions in the, in the world, in any country, they tend to be short-sighted and short-term, because that's how you get it re-elected. So I haven't seen any data that suggests that we are going to the right path since the Kyoto meeting in 97. Emissions are still going up. Paris Agreement and 26 COPs later, emissions are still going up. So I believe by using the platforms like Extreme E and Education, um, I hope that's the only way that we can actually have a chance and uh, we just have to work and hope for the best. No, 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 no. No way. We cannot hope for the best, Luca. We have to work for the yeah, best. Work for the best. That's the difference, Correct. okay? It's not about just sitting back and hoping that things are going to get better. It's about standing up and doing exactly what we need to do. Because I'm telling you, seven generations down, those children born seven generations down are going to turn back and they're going to say, what did you do? What did you do? And if anybody says, I did the best I could, <laughs> bullshit, okay? It's not about doing the best that we can. It's about doing what is necessary. And the difference between those two things, therein lies the future of humanity. Nothing less. <laughs> Christiana and Luca, uh, our superstars, thank you very much indeed. It's been a pleasure to have this discussion with you. We're in good hands with you too. Okay, thank you, Isi, uh, for the introduction. But be before I go on the last section of this uh, workshop, then I'd like to mediate between the last statements of uh, 
Christiana and Luca, because I really uh, believe that there is hope, but I believe there is active hope. So in fact, somebody defined that active hope is a verb that is spelled with the sleeves roll up, right? So hope doesn't happen just by itself. You need to work for it, right? So I think that's the middle ground between uh, Luca and uh, Christiana, that the hope requires action. And uh, in this uh, last uh, uh, sector of the, of the uh, workshop, which is going to be about half an hour more, so please bear with me. Uh, please bear with me and keep uh, silent if possible. Uh, we're going to uh, finish the, the theme of tipping point. So uh, the theme of this uh, uh, additional components of the program that are about uh, discussing and sharing visions is called tipping points. And tipping points are about dramatic change and breaking, uh, breaking boundaries. Uh, we often uh, t think about tipping points about uh, negative boundaries, but here we're going to deliver the power of our community to uh, break, break boundaries in the right direction. We're going to wor work together, deliver the power of this ecosystem to generate action. But uh, we're in the ecosystem of Extreme E, but the ecosystem of Extreme E today is embedded in a broader ecosystem, which is Greenland. And uh, I would like to uh, acknowledge the people of Greenland who have been the custodians of this land for more than 4,000 years, 5,000 years, and have kept an extraordinary balance between their culture and the nature that they belong to. So uh, we, we would have liked uh, to have more uh, cultural elements in our workshop, but due to uh, COVID uh, limitations, uh, May, may I please ask you to, uh, to keep quiet because I'm getting distracted a bit. Sorry. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, so uh, we, we did not have the opportunity to have uh, a lot of social content and cultural content because uh, due to the COVID bubble, we could not bring uh, colleagues and uh, people and uh, local communities from elsewhere. So we've been forced to try to adapt this element uh, using mostly remote uh, resources, but uh, we have improvised a, a little uh, example of the spirituality of Greenlandic uh, people. So earlier on, you were able to enjoy drum uh, dancing and also an explanation about the sled dog culture in Greenland. But today, uh, we actually have with us uh, one um, one uh, mask dancer. So that's another form of a traditional dance. Uh, in Greenland, and I would like to uh, call uh, Aviana Steinbacher to uh, come and join us here at the States. Yes. Yeah, so th this element of uh, Greenland, the culture has actually improvised just now, just before <laughs> lunch, but uh, Aviana is going to uh, walk you through uh, uh, mask dancing and what it means and is going to explain you the deep meaning of, of that practice which actually will give you an insight into the spirituality of a Greenlandic culture and the roots in nature. Over to Aviana. Thank you. Hello, my name is Aviana Steinbacher. I am an actor and cultural practitioner. So when I studied at the National Theatre School of Greenland, I was taught our cultural practices. And I'm very lucky to be sharing a bit about one of those uh, today, which is the Greenlandic mask dance, and we call it Uayilnuk. So Uayilnuk is different depending on where you are in Greenland, but this is the way I've been taught. So the video can just start now. This is Lakuluk, and she is doing the Greenlandic mask dance. So every color represents something. There is the black color that she's about to put on, and that represents the mysterious and the unknown and the spiritual world. And then there is the white color or the skin color, which represents our ancestors' bones. And she's also she's drawing symbols with the with that. And then she will be putting on some red, the red color. It represents blood running through our veins and warmth and love. 
and every symbol also um, represents something. So uh, the thing she's drawing, it represents the male and female parts because you are neither when doing the dance. And then we also use a mouth stick, which is just a piece of wood that we put in the mouth. And then that represents the male parts too. And then there's three parts to the dance. And they, all of them were also used back in the day to teach something. So there's the funny part to the dance, which was just used as entertainment. And then um, there was the scary part, which was used to teach children reflexes when scared. Like if they saw a polar bear, they wouldn't just freeze. And then there is the vulgar seducing part, which was used to break sex as a, which was used to break the taboo around sex, because um, the population was so small in the villages that they had to reproduce. So doing the dance, you just, you mix the three of them together and yes. I can dig much deeper, so if you have any questions later, um, when we're done, you're, you're welcome to ask me. Um, but yeah, now you know a little bit about the Greenlandic Mask Dance. Thank you. Thank you, please join me uh, thanking Aviana for her explanation. Thank you, Aviana. So in fact, this is a photo of Aviana's uh, Mask Dancing group. And Aviana is actually the one in the far right corner, right? So hopefully next year when we are back to uh, Greenland, we'll, uh, we'll be able to enjoy active uh, mass dancing and many other elements of Greenlandic culture, and particularly the one I excel at, which is a uh, Greenland in polka, which we are unable to perform today also. <laughs> so uh, thank you, Aviana. And uh, we actually wanted to have a round of applause again for Aviana. And uh, we, we wanted to have a number of uh, voices from Greenland, uh, Greenland perspectives on climate change. Because for us as we're in the world, uh, Greenland is ice that is melting, is sea level going up on our, on our shores. But we don't think much about how this is felt and lived in Greenland. And unfortunately, due to a, a bubble and COVID limitations, we could not uh, fly uh, colleagues from Nuuk and other places here but we have a number of very short, so that three to four minutes uh, statements from uh, different uh, scientists uh, from Greenland on how they perceive climate change and how it is affecting Greenland. So the first uh, element in the, in the presentation is uh, by David Buckley. Uh, so David works with the um, Natural Resources Institute that is uh, located in Nuuk. I collaborate a lot with them. Uh, and David is particularly working in the Department of Natural Resources and is in charge of him, uh, advising Greenland, the government, on uh, mining access and regulation of uh, mining and oil and gas resources. So you probably saw in the news about a month ago that the Greenland, the government, which actually sits in huge resources for minerals uh, and uh, gas and oil, uh, passed a bill that uh, put a moratorium on oil and gas exploitation in Greenlandic waters, even though they have uh, huge resources. So uh, if we can have uh, David's statement, please. Can we play? Higher temperatures, from global Higher temperatures from global climate change have resulted in melting of the ice cap and glaciers and a reduction in the extent and duration of sea ice. For most of the world, this has resulted in a rise in sea level. But for Greenland, the opposite is happening. Loss of ice has meant a reduction in the weight of the landmass, resulting in uplift due to geostatic rebound, and so local sea level is falling at differing rates around the country. Falling sea levels, rather than inundating coastal communities, risk leaving coastal marine infrastructure stranded, making waterways difficult to navigate and disrupting intertidal and shallow subtidal benthic habitats. The consequences for the local communities can mean reduced hunting opportunities, challenges with boat travel, and difficulties accessing waterways and shorelines, as well as the need for new infrastructure. 
We are currently looking at these issues through a research program in collaboration with the Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory at Columbia University. This research has a strong community engagement and co-production element to ensure that the impacts of these changes on local lives and livelihood is assessed and the knowledge gained shared with those most affected. Decreasing sea ice and thawing of the land can, however, also increase access to previously difficult waterways in coastal areas. This is noticeable in the Arctic more generally and in Greenland specifically by a steady increase in international shipping traffic through our waters. This increased accessibility is also resulting in an increased interest in Greenland's considerable mineral wealth. One of the consequences of switching to green energy to combat climate change will be, at least in the short and medium term, an increased demand for raw materials to build power generation and storage infrastructure and equipment. Greenland is a potential major source for many of these raw materials. And so ironically, the impact of climate change in Greenland are making the very resources we need to combat it more accessible. This comes with both enormous opportunity and potential risk for the people of Greenland. Mining will create jobs and result in new and improved infrastructure and generate wealth for the country. This could result in improved standard of living, but also runs the risk of a two-tiered society those benefiting directly off mining with potential well-paid jobs and those in other industries on potentially lower wages finding it harder to get by as the cost of living increases. The other risk is environmental. Resource extraction obviously causes great disturbance to the environment. Simply digging things out of the ground changes the landscape, but there is the additional infrastructure to support mines, air and water contamination, disruption to wildlife, and all the added impact of having people living and working in new areas. This on top of an environment already being disrupted and disturbed by changing global climate. The environmental risks are very real, as are the consequences to the people of Greenland. There is, however, a review process of all projects by the government, which includes community consultation to mitigate the environmental footprint of the extractive industry. In addition, the Greenland Institute of Natural Resources, along with our colleagues in the Danish Center for Environment and Energy, provide impartial review and advice on all new and ongoing projects, as well as conducting applied research. As the climate of Greenland changes, along with how people use the land and water, there'll be greater need for further research to understand and mitigate the results of these impacts. So the next statement will be by, uh, yes, well, he cannot hear us, but uh, let's give him a, a round of applause. And the next statement will be by uh, Dr. Thomas uh, Jules Pedersen. Uh, Thomas is the director of the Arctic Climate Center in Nuuk, and he will give us also additional perspectives because they have been running a long-term monitoring program that is focusing on detecting and quantifying the impacts of climate change on the environment and ecosystems. So over to the video from Thomas, please. Greenland is a country dependent on its natural resources. Particularly the marine resources are of vital importance from a cultural subsistence and economic perspective. 95% of Greenland's export income comes from the export of marine resources. And two thirds of this income comes from the halibut and shrimp fisheries alone. A large proportion of the export income comes from inshore and coastal fisheries. Fisheries which are also important local food resources. Increasing temperatures and changing uh, precipitation has been resulting in changes to the Greenland ice sheet and glaciers, particularly in the past decades. This in turn affects the discharge of freshwater, thus impacting the coastal ecosystems. Effects that potentially impact the entire coastal ecosystem from microscopic plankton up to the large marine mammals and seabirds. We have been conducting and collaborating on a multitude of coastal research projects alongside ongoing monitoring of key parameters during the past several decades. And results from these studies show that the glacier fjord ocean interactions to a large degree define these coastal ecosystems. Particularly the fjord systems represent convergence zones between glaciers and ice sheet on one side and oceanic conditions on the other side, creating unique marine ecosystems which are often highly productive. One important point to keep in mind regarding fjord ecosystems 
is that it's not only the amount of meltwater coming from the ice sheet and uh, ice glaciers that is important. It's also the way it's delivered or discharged into these fjord systems. Glaciers can be divided into marine terminating glaciers, which are in direct contact with the fjord water, and land terminating glaciers, which are terminating on land and often have milled rivers flowing into the connecting fjords. When fresh water is coming from land terminating glaciers, it's often positioning itself on top of the fjord water or at the surface due to its lower density. This melted water contains very limited or no nutrients or other compounds beneficial to the living organisms in these fjords. Thus, the melted water from land terminating glaciers may have a limited or even a negative effect on the productivity of these fjord systems. In contrast, meltwater from marine terminating glaciers is often delivered or discharged into the fjords at the bottom of the glaciers in these typically deep fjords. Because this fresh water is lighter than the saline fjord water, it quickly rises towards the surface. When this upwelling happens, it brings along or entrains a large amount of nutrient-rich bottom fjord water. Milk water from marine terminating glaciers may therefore introduce new nutrients into the sunlight or sunlit uh, surface water at a time in summer when nutrients are often depleted due to ongoing high production by phytoplankton. The result of this upwelling of new nutrients at marine terminating glaciers is a higher primary production in summer compared to fjord systems with land terminating or no glaciers. This high productivity by microscopic phytoplankton in turn constitutes a high food supply for larger organisms, thus having a positive effect up through the food web. A recent study has shown that coastal halibut fisheries tend to be concentrated in or around fjords with marine terminating glaciers. Thus, it is of great interest how changes in climate may affect the amount of meltwater and how it is delivered to these coastal uh, waters. If glaciers are melting faster and more of the marine terminating glaciers retreat onto land, becoming land terminating glaciers. More than a thousand halibut fishery licenses are issued every year in Greenland, which together with the processing of halibut in factories makes halibut fishery the largest employer in Greenland, employing around 2% of the population of Greenland. It is therefore a fair statement to say that Greenland is highly dependent on its coastal marine ecosystems and will be affected what happens to these ecosystems in a changing climate. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, last we had a uh, scientist uh, was going to join us here and traveled from Denmark to uh, join us here, but unfortunately on Thursday she ran into a uh, COVID contingency that has put her into quarantine and is unable to be with us. So we'll have just a very short, uh, very short statement and she and I were talking about this and, and please uh, show the last video. Hello, Dorte, good to see you. Hello, Carlos, good to see you too. So I'm, I'm very sorry that uh, you cannot join us due to COVID contingencies, <clears throat> but I would like you first to uh, if you could uh, kindly introduce yourself. Yeah, my name is Dorte Krause Jensen, and I work at Aarhus University, the Department of Bioscience, and I'm also affiliated with the Arctic Research Center at Aarhus University. Mm. Thank you. In fact, we are colleagues. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I would like to uh, ask uh, if you could maybe give us a, a summary of your research journey in Greenland. When, when did it start and what has it been about? Well, the first time I was in Greenland was in 1999 in northeastern Greenland in Young Sound, next to the Danish military station Sirius. And I was involved in a research program there that was one of the first uh, related to, the, um, to that region. So, and then I was there again the year after in 2000. Uh, and from then on, I have uh, 
mostly been on the west coast uh, of Greenland. I have been working in the monitoring program uh, in, in Nuuk and also with the research programs uh, around Nuuk in the marine uh, coastal waters. Uh, I mainly work on the forests of the sea, um, macroalgae and seagrasses. And actually, in addition to the monitoring program, uh, and the research programs around Nuuk. I've also been involved, I was lucky to get uh, on a cruise along Greenland's uh, coast, all the way from Kangasusuak and uh, up to uh, the northernmost uh, village of Greenland, uh, Siorapaluk, at almost 79 north. And we were, it was a tourist cruise, but we were two scientists on board that had the opportunity to sample on the way. So when the tourists were visiting uh, the settlements, we, um, we were studying the marine forests along this long gradient. Oh, thank you, Dorte. So one last uh, question and is in, in your research journey in uh, Greenland, uh, have you experienced anything that has personally moved you in, besides, besides the research component? Mm. Well, I have uh, well enjoyed being in contact with the locals in, in Greenland and uh, learning about their, their life. And um, well, but in Nuuk, I have also seen the backside of uh, the Greenland uh, society with uh, um, people that, um, yeah, that uh, don't uh, have their, uh, their usual occupation and people who are, uh, yeah, really, uh, uh, well, sad in a sad condition, and that I guess that has uh, touched me the most. Mm. Yeah, thank you, Dorte. So, even though you cannot be here in person, then I'm going to uh, because we collaborate in some of this research, then I will give on your behalf and also with my contribution a uh, talk describing some of your findings here in, uh, in Greenland. Thank you very much, and we look forward to uh, seeing you soon in the future. And, uh, and see you in Greenland, but also see you on board Santa Elena. And thank you for doing the presentation. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. So this brings uh, uh, the contributions on uh, perspectives on uh, changing Greenland to, to an end. Uh, I would just like to give you one minute of uh, what Dorte was going to present, and is that whereas we've heard of uh, negative impacts, uh, Greenland has 15% of the whole shoreline of the, of the globe. And there's one ecosystem that is driven due to a uh, uh, decrease in ice, which is a uh, algal forest, kelp. So kelp forests are expanding in uh, Greenland due to the reduced in, uh, reduction in ice cover very strongly, and we project massive increases in kelp forest in the Arctic with climate change. Kelp forests bring a, lo a lot of benefits. They are nursery areas for fisheries. They also sequester carbon, so they somehow contribute to mitigate climate change. And uh, lastly, also, um, uh, seaweed can actually be used for many, many uses. Biofuels can be used also to produce polymers that display synthetic plastics and so on. So I think this uh, is going to be an important resource and a growing resource in uh, Greenland. It can also be used as food and fuel. But then uh, I met with uh, the major of, uh, of uh, Ilulisat to discuss the opportunities in Greenland with expanding, expanding uh, kelp forest. And after about, about an hour of discussion of the many opportunities, then he told me, yes, this is great, but there's a problem with the name. So how come there's a problem with the name of kelp? And then he explained that the Greenlandic na name for kelp, if we translate it to English, it'll be something like that thing that you use to clean yourself after going to the toilet. So then it is difficult to then think of it as a very positive element, but it's one that is expanding in the, in the, in the waters around Greenland. So this cartoon that you were seeing behind uh, Dorte's, uh, that is in Dorte's office, is a Greenlandic uh, part of Greenlandic culture, and is that a marine life upon which the well-being depends actually comes from the mother of the sea, called Sedna. So Sedna has a marine life embedded in her hair, 
and it releases marine life for the benefit of people. But if people are too greedy, then Sedna will retain marine life in her hair, and therefore uh, people will need to reduce their greed and come back to term and then plead to Sedna to release their marine life again and then come back to terms with, uh, with nature and Sedna and balance. So that's an, a, a story of sustainability and how uh, sustainability is a guiding principle since 5,000 years and continues to be in Greenlandic culture. And I would like to end by acknowledging uh, uh, Paniqua uh, Christensen, who is with us today. Please, uh, Paniqua, stand, stand with us. I would like uh, you to recognize Paniqua Christensen, who's the head of the Department of Economy, Personal and Service, and the manager of the Superheroes Pingo Dita Pit Parsi Sui program, which is a program to inspire peop, uh, young, young Greenlander children to take a, a action on climate, on environment, on economy by themselves. And she's within the Ministry of Agriculture, self sufficiency Energy and Environment, and has been helping us for, with her team for about three months to understand better how uh, Greenland is experiencing climate change. So I would like to thank Paniqua, and I would like you to uh, uh, leave me a round of applause for her work. And then, uh, again, uh, she will be assisted uh, in uh, giving some words of, uh, of response. Thank you, Carlos. Uh, we have been happy to help you, and uh, we look forward to help you again if you come next year. And we are very happy also you used uh, our uh, superheroes on your campaign. Uh, so it is very important to us because we want to inspire all the children and the youngs because like they said, uh, the adults, they are kind of di difficult to change their minds too. So it's just easier with the children. So our project is is going bigger and bigger. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, with this, uh, Panikwa made a reference to uh, extreme involvement in the Superheroes program. So there has been a contribution specifically delivered by Luisa Via Roma, uh, which uh, have produced uh, new costumes for new superheroes to contribute to the program, which are superheroes that are going to deliver climate action from Greenland. And I think you will see soon uh, a very impressive outcome of that project. Uh, so I'm not going to unveil it here, but uh, please stay tuned to news on that. And uh, with this, I would like to end by uh, thanking uh, Velocity and Aurora for uh, helping with the recording and uh, a and, uh, um, organization of the event and also Anya and her team for also organizing this. And hand it over now to Alejandro to close the event. Thank you very much, Carlos. Uh, thank you for also uh, the contributions that we had from uh, Greenland. And, uh, you know, um, it's great to um, have the voice from this location, from this country. But it's so funny that um, we met completely by chance. And um, I have no idea, of course, who you were. We met in the port of uh, Kangerluswag, also with Henrik, who is there, um, and with his wife, his family, all his family. And now we become friends, only in these few days. Eh? And I know we will have a very long friendship. It's so I'm so happy to have now Greenlandic friends. And suddenly, also, you are the responsible for the environment of the uh, Greenland government. How um, small is the world? Um, I guess that was destiny. So really has been an incredible experience for me. Uh, we will continue uh, tonight. Uh, and well, I always say, I always end the same way. Um, but before I do, I want to thank everyone. I want to thank especially uh, Carlos and Peter from our scientific committee and Richard. Without you, this event would be completely different without the same uh, meaning. And um, thank all of you for being here, for making history, this little part of the motorsport history. I think today we made motorsport history because, of course, never a motorsport race had happened in Greenland. We are breaking new terrain. So thank you. Thank you all for that.